Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? I was copying some data from a FireWire drive to my 12-inch PowerBook G4 when suddenly the process slowed down dramatically, and I started hearing some very unwelcome sounds. Clearly, this laptop's hard drive is not long for this world. I used a coin to release the battery, which also reveals the computer's specifications. A 1.5 GHz PowerPC G4 processor, 512 MB of RAM, and an 80 GB hard drive. That drive is buried inside the machine, so naturally, the RAM cover needs to come off. Okay, there's a good reason for this. One of the screws that holds down the keyboard is hidden inside. The others are a bit trickier to find. I pop the F1 and F2 keycaps free. It's important to lever them up from the left side, then unhook them from their scissor switches on the right. I did the same for F11 and F12, then peeled up the circular stickers between each set using a flathead screwdriver. This revealed the two remaining screws holding the keyboard in place, which I could then flip over onto the palm rest. Careful prying with a spudger got the keyboard ribbon cable popped free. This was a big departure in design from Apple's previous few laptop models, which had latches holding their keyboards in place, and was how you accessed commonly replaced parts like the RAM. On these aluminum G4 models, though, all that removing the keyboard does is expose more screws. I printed out the relevant page from the service manual, and as I remove the screws, I tape them to the diagram. Many of these are different lengths, and it's important to not mix them up. I also found out the hard way that some of these screws are made of a fairly soft metal by accidentally stripping the head on one. I tried using a flathead bit to break it free, but that only twisted the bit. I also tried the old school rubber band trick to get more grip, but that didn't work either, and neither did a small screw extractor. So I ended up masking off the area with tape to keep metal shavings from getting inside the machine, chucking up an appropriately sized bit, and simply drilling the head off the screw. I hate when I have to do this, but the combination of the thread locking compound applied at the factory and the soft metal of the screw head gave me few other options. There are several other screws that hold the top cover on. Two are on the right side, another two are on the left, and two more are on the back, but just the ones closest to the display need to come out. The final three screws are back where we started, inside the battery compartment. I stood the machine on its left side to make accessing a couple of retaining clips easier. Some careful prying with a spudger released them from the bottom case, though the top cover wasn't quite ready to come free just yet. I needed to run the spudger through the gap across the front edge to release a few more small clips, and then down the left side. The trackpad ribbon cable is rather short, but there's a handy cutout to access its connector. Then I could lift the top cover just enough to reach inside and disconnect the microphone cable and the power button wiring. That finally gave me access to the drive. In this case, a 5400 RPM ATA100 unit from Toshiba. Its bracket is held in with two screws, and like the trackpad connector, the drive's ribbon cable has a handy loop to grab it by. But the question then was, what should I replace it with? Since this is an IDE drive, there's primarily three choices. The simplest and most obvious one is to just swap in another mechanical drive. While it doesn't seem like brand new IDE drives are being made anymore, they were incredibly common, so used replacements are plentiful. I already had a 30 gig drive on hand. But they're slow, noisy, and as the original drive demonstrated, prone to failure. 
Another popular option in retro computing circles is compact flashcards. Interestingly, these natively use the ATA protocol, so a simple and cheap adapter is all that's needed to connect them to a desktop or laptop. Being solid state, they're silent and much more durable than a mechanical drive. But there are a few downsides. Depending on the card you buy, there can be dramatic differences in performance and the longevity of the flash media. Also, some operating systems won't install on drives that they detect as removable, which is what most compact flash cards report themselves as. A few models can be switched into fixed device mode. I did an episode about that if you're curious to learn more. And there are also so-called industrial cards meant to be used for that purpose. But those can be somewhat expensive in larger capacities, so most people using CF cards as hard drives do so with machines much older than this PowerBook, where having a lot of storage doesn't quite matter as much. That leaves one relatively new option, and it's what I opted to go with. It's possible to buy solid-state IDE drives designed specifically to replace a mechanical drive in an older computer. You can pick one up in a variety of capacities, but the reality of these is that most of them are simply an adapter board with an MSATA SSD piggybacked on top. You can install whatever size SSD you want. I swapped a 128GB unit into mine, and the bare adapters routinely sell for under $20 US. No, the operating systems in older machines may not have support for the trim command, but MSATA drives pretty commonly include garbage collection routines in their chipsets, which should be quite adequate. With the new drive installed, I put the machine back together just enough to confirm that it would be recognized correctly. I booted from a portable Firewire drive, and checking in disk utility, it did indeed show up, and I was able to format it successfully. I pulled the top cover off again so I could do some cleaning before reassembly. Dirt tends to accumulate in the gap between the top and bottom cases, but an alcohol wipe made quick work of it. This machine is overall in very good shape, save for a few small scuffs here and there, which were common for this model anyway. While this specific machine is a relatively recent acquisition for me, I owned one of these back when they were new and remember it fondly. In fact, the 12-inch PowerBook G4 seemed to be a favorite among retro Mac collectors. They were fast and capable, but quite compact. The aluminum PowerBook G4s in general were well received when they launched in late 2003, and subsequent revisions brought faster speeds and more features. I got a copy of OS X installed, which went very quickly. Partly due to the speed of the FireWire drive I installed it from, but also the much faster write speed the SSD offers. What also helps performance with this machine is its 1.5 GHz processor, the fastest offered in the 12-inch model, and it's maxed out 1.25 GB of RAM. And of course, the computer is silent now, except for when the CPU fan needs to occasionally kick in. There's only one minor problem with this unit, a couple of bright spots at the bottom of the display. I suspect there might be something going bad with the CCFL backlight, but for now, these don't really bother me. If they get worse, I'll investigate what an LCD panel replacement would entail. So replacing the drive was a decent amount of work, definitely more involved than other laptops from this one's era, but in the end, having the original drive fail was probably a blessing in disguise. The new SSD is a major improvement, and I think a lot of retro computers would benefit from the same upgrade. It's great that there are several choices available for such machines now. And as long as you're willing to put in the effort, there should be little holding you back from bringing your vintage computer just a bit more into the modern era. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at ThisDoesNotComp. And as always, thanks for watching.